I'm honored to be here today following such two expert panelists in this field, and I am going to focus my talks today on the future possibilities of medicine and technology, or at least what I think those possibilities are. So we're going to start out with the immediate future, which we really do know somewhat at least what's going to happen in the future because these are the pieces of legislation that were passed by the Texas legislature this most recent uh, full session that automatically changed some things in our state, or at least will starting in September and January. So the very first of these bills was House Bill 4. And what this really does is expand teleservices with Medicaid and CHIP. And you'll notice that I'm saying here, teleservices, not telemedicine. Telemedicine has actually been a Medicaid uh, benefit for quite a few, uh, a few months now, actually several years, um, with the passage of some prior legislation. And the session before this really did advance that pretty far. But what this new bill does is it expands tele into other types of services that I've listed here for you, like the therapies, the nutritional counseling, case management, preventative services, all those types of things. And what it's going to do is require Health and Human Services to offer a teleoption when it's cost and clinically effective. Now, that still gives the HHSC folks plenty of discretion to determine when this is effective. So it's, it's not going to be there for every single service because the truth is it's not an appropriate modality for every single service. But for the services where they think it's going to be effective, this is now going to be available. This is a pretty large expansion of benefits, and it just sort of takes what we were doing in medicine, in telemedicine, and broadens the scope across all of the various sort of health and human services that are available through HHSC. Um, now, there is a portion here related to audio for behavioral health, um, but that is only for behavioral health, and it's only for cost and clinically effective services in that area. It also, on the second page here, we're going to talk a little bit about how it allows reimbursement for things like telemonitoring. Now, in our state, we've had this benefit for quite some time, but the truth of the matter, it was very narrowly tailored. Only a very, very, very small sliver of the population qualified for this. Um, but this is going to be a much broader benefit now. And it's also going to allow HHSC to take a look at rules and allow things like verbal consent for telemedicine services. And even going down into the very nitty gritty of administration, like contact methods and case management and, and all those types of things, you can see there it's talking about MCOs and, and all that type of thing we really are going to see a technological advance in the way that we are talking about services as well as how those services are being delivered. Um, so this is going to be an exciting time to see what efficiencies we can gain uh, through some of these options. The other equally important bill that happened this session relates to HB5 broadband services. So obviously it doesn't do any good to have this available as a service if you can't actually get the internet or the underlying infrastructure uh, in your area to be able to use them. Now, the truth of the matter is a very large part of our state actually does have broadband services, but there are definitely pockets which do not have sufficient broadband services to really get good medical um, care in, in all its variants because there's sort of two pieces to broadband services. One is the download speed, and that's what we're all familiar with, right? If you're trying to watch a video on YouTube or if you want to look at a website or if you're trying to get something off of Netflix, that is going to be your download speed. And that's really what generally people tend to care about because you're wanting the content to be delivered to you. The thing with medicine and, and all of the services affiliated with it is we also need what's called the upload speed. In other words, how fast can I send information from my home to that provider that I'm talking to? And that is something that really hasn't been a focus 
uh, and is required. You have to have it to be able to adequately have video interactions because you need both sides to be able to send information um, in a reliable way. So the Broadband Development Council is going to be attached to the comptroller. Um, they have already started work on this. They have a very short timeline. Uh, they have to get uh, an adoption of a statewide plan in place within a year of the bill passing. And as I'm speaking to you, the bill's already passed. So this is going to be fairly fast for them. Um, they're going to be looking at ways to give loans and incentives and grants to expand access. And it's this underlying infrastructure that's really going to allow us to capitalize on the availability of these other types of services from trainings to telementoring to telemedicine to telemonitoring, all the tellers you can possibly think of, all rest with this. So this is going to be a fairly significant piece. There's a handful of other pieces of legislation that directly talked about telehealth. Um, and the two that are really, really significant for purposes of what we're discussing today is HB 2056, which pretty much makes teledentistry a thing in our state. Um, up till now, there had been you know, lots of questions between what the dental board rules would allow, what they wouldn't allow. Um, but this comes out and basically says, look, teledentistry is allowable. Um, and here are the limits that we're going to put in place. Um, for supervision and for prescribing. Um, and the dental board can write rules, you know, within that. But most importantly, it establishes coverage requirements. It makes it a covered benefit. Um, and that really is significant. Now, I do want to take a really quick thing to note that it sets prescribing limits here as to two days of opiates and five days of non-opiates for controlled substances, i.e. painkillers generally for the dental office services, but it is only as federally allowed. Um, the DEA is using enforcement discretion right now. They are not enforcing the Ryan Height Act, which requires you to see a patient in person before you can prescribe to them a controlled substance via telemedicine. But that will end when the public health emergency declaration ends. So keep in mind that while this is an option, uh, now, it won't be in the immediate future unless and until the DEA changes the rules on that. So we'll be watching for that to happen, but, but just know that that's out there. And then Senate Bill 40 um, really is very little words for what is a pretty big effect, which says that any professional licensed under Title III can provide a telehealth service as allowed by Chapter 111. And for those of you who don't read the Occupations Code every day, um, I, let me tell you what that means. Chapter 111 is where the laws that I referenced earlier that made telemedicine a, a service um, many, many years ago and was continually updated uh, by the legislature as technology developed, that's where the telemedicine standards live. Title III is the part of the Occupations Code where all of the licensing professions sort of live within the law. If you are a healthcare provider that has some type of certification or licensure, you almost certainly exist in that title, Title III. So with a very broad brush, this came along and said, look, we're not going to piecemeal this out for telemedicine for doctors and teledentistry. Those two have their own bills, but this says all of you, all of you that are licensed healthcare providers under Title III can now offer telehealth services. So that's a pretty big deal um, when you think about it. It, it really is going to open a lot of doors to services that, you know, we might not think of as using tele, but really are appropriate for it. Things like lactation counseling, nutritional consulting, genetic counseling, all these things that really exist in a robust healthcare system are now going to be available uh, without question through telehealth, at least legally allowed. And the last thing I wanna talk about is Texas has finally joined the Physician Compact. Um, you can see on that map there that when we're one of the later states to do so, but I'm pretty sure we are the largest state to do so 
in, in line with what we're seeing right there. New York has also uh, got legislation introduced. I'm not sure that that has fully passed yet. Um, but we are now going to be a state that allows physicians, once they are licensed in the state of Texas and become certified by the Compact Commission, they can then go and become licensed in any of these other states that are dark blue or purple um, simply by registering, by paying whatever fees that state requires and registering. Uh, so it's really going to allow a lot of flexibility. And the opposite is also true, right? If I'm an Oklahoma provider right there at the top of, of Texas where the Red River Valley runs and I've got a patient who's crossing the border to see me, I will be able to get a Texas license, assuming I meet the requirements of the compact, and see that patient via telemedicine. So this is really going to have pretty large reverberations on the flexibilities and allowances for, for practicing telemedicine around the country. Um, you can see the numbers there. They started this uh, April 2017, and they've already issued over 20,000 licenses. So this is going to be a real opportunity for many of the projects in our state to, to get some footing and, and really have a national impact. Looking forward, so beyond the next couple of years, which is what we just kind of looked at in, the, in specifically as it relates to our state, um, I think what you're going to continue to see is this broadening of services beyond just this one idea of telemedicine. Um, so you're going to be seeing things expand and expand and expand continuously like telementoring and teletraining, right? The, the, the federal government obviously recognized this, which is why they created this national center. There's got to be a way to make people aware of the options that are available for them. But there are a few things that we really are going to have to figure out if we want these to be successfully adopted. Number one, we're going to have to be really clear on when licensing is required and when it isn't right? Um, quite frankly, for projects that are educational in nature, if we are training the next generation of healthcare providers, depending on what you're doing with that training, you probably don't need a license to do that. But we really would be well served to come out and say, this is what's required and this isn't. The same for telementor, right? If what you're doing is not actually diagnosing or treating an individual patient, well, then the likelihood that you need a license is pretty low. So that's another clarification that I think would be really helpful to kind of coordinate together with all the licensing entities and make sure that we're all on that same page and that providers feel comfortable in, in, in doing these services to allow them to expand. We've already talked a little bit about technology, but of course, it's required. We're going to have to have ways for people to consistently um, be able to connect with each other in ways that are HIPAA compliant, that are encrypted. Um, there's a lot of talk about this on, you know, there's flexibilities in place right now with the public health emergency. Are they going to stay in place? I'm telling you right now, not for HIPAA. I, I would be very surprised. Those guidelines are going to come back. Those requirements that you have HIPAA compliant connections, that you have encrypted connections, whatever you're doing to put in place to ensure that that health information is safe and secure, those things are going to come back. Um, so we need to find a way to be able to talk to each other within those types of requirements. We need to talk about what is the standard of care when we're talking about things like telementoring? What does that look like? You know, obviously, it's going to be on the patient receiving in. We want them to have that same standard of care that they would have had in an in-person visit. And that, that's pretty much going to be what we expect. But how does that look on the back end? What's expected when we're expecting doctors to come together through a setup, maybe like Project Echo? What does that look like? How do you document that? And then finally, we're going to need to get some traction on payments. Um, right now... Um, things like telementoring are only reimbursable in a handful of states, and we need that to change. Um, we need to be able to reimburse physicians on a standard basis, as well as any other providers like PAs, APNs, dietitians, 
all those folks that make up a robust healthcare team, we need to be able to find a way to compensate them for that time because otherwise it's just not something that's ever going to move forward um, primarily because healthcare already operates on such thin margins. Um, there's not a lot of space to just start up new projects with no funding. And while there are grant funds available, they're always time limited, right? And we don't want to create that type of project where you start the project, you do it for two years, and now it's gone because there's no funding mechanism. So that's really something that we're going to have to work hard on. So that's what I see as the future, both in the near and the far. Um, I am very excited to be working with Dr. Allison and, and the folks at the new center on how we can move forward and, and make some of these things part of our everyday healthcare landscape. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you.